Thank you very much, Madam. And I'll uh, take the liberty of speaking in French. I'd like to begin by mentioning uh, the words of Mr. Peterson, who once said that uh, birds have wings, they're free, they can fly wherever they want when they want. They have the type of mobility which uh, many people would envy. And uh, we know that around half a billion birds migrate on an annual basis between Africa, Asia and Europe. They look for food and for a place to make their nest and they're at home at the beginning and at the end of these journeys that they make. Around 3% of the global human population also lives outside its uh, country of birth. In fact, one in seven people today consider themselves migrants, but following the rapid degradation of natural resources across the earth for many people and increasing numbers of people there's a certain amount of vulnerability and uh, migration is nothing to be envied they have to migrate in fact because they're no longer able to stay at home now when lands are used inappropriately and climate change is thrown into the bargain People move firstly to the nearest available plot of agricultural land, and often that involves forests. 80% of deforestation pressures around the world are the result of agricultural expansion. Of course, once the earth is exhausted in those areas, migration is obligatory. People have to move elsewhere. And so we find ourselves in a paradigm of degradation, abandonment and migration. Often people have to find themselves in cities and there they become vulnerable. We're preparing a perfect storm here, and a number of different factors are contributing to one another. We expect the global population to reach almost 9 billion by 2050, and there will be many increases in problems with access to water and the like. Agricultural lands will become even rarer than they currently are in many regions of the world. Even today, 12 million hectares of agricultural lands are lost annually because of desertification. And over the course of the next 25 years, the reduction in the quality of lands could lead to around 12% as a reduction in global food production. Meanwhile, according to the IPCC, the average agricultural yield could drop by 2% every 10 years, which would lead potentially to an increase of 30% in global food prices. Meanwhile, water will become increasingly rare because global warming causes the Earth to lose its humidity and its water breaks the water cycle and leads to increasing periods of drought. In 2050, more than 5 billion people will probably live in drought-affected regions. The limits of our capacity will thus have been achieved in many different areas. Over the course of the next few decades, 135 million people will be di displaced by desertification and land degradation. And Africa is particularly vulnerable. The population is growing by around 3% annually, and around 80% of people in that area depend on the product productivity of the lands, which are decreasing in quality. Climate change is a massive factor here. We already see increases in temperature in that region and uh, precipitation is also being affected in Niger and Chad. 
We've seen more than a million displaced by these factors. 3.5% of the Senegalese population has migrated from rural to urban areas over the course of the past five years. In many cases, these migrant populations go to areas which, have, which struggle to accommodate them. And it's worth stressing that competition for access to lands and water resources then leads to conflicts between different communities. We could look at Syria, for instance. Between 2006 and 2010, Syria met with the worst drought in its history. 60% of agriculture in Syria was destroyed as a result of it, and agricultors lost up to 80% of their cattle, which led to the displacement of a million people thereabouts to towns. And then there were the Iraqi refugees who came in as well. Even though there are many different causes for the conflict in Syria at the current time, we know that climate change-related issues have exacerbated the problem. Given the foreseeable nature of climate change phenomena over the course of the next few decades, we know that these phenomena will become increasingly common, and we need to face these challenges with pragmatism. Efficient management of temporary and permanent migration may be one strategy which will allow us to face up to these changes. Migrants, in particular, those who are of working age could make a positive contribution to these environmental issues. Droughts, for instance, can be anticipated. We know that these problems won't go away, and we're in a position to identify and to map out the hotspots where migration is concerned before these issues arise. If we work together, then, in managing lands and other natural resources efficiently, we know that this could help to reduce forced migration and bolster drought resilience and climate change resilience, while also ensuring the security of food supplies. The UN Convention on the Fight Against Desertification seeks to forge a certain neutrality where land degradation is concerned at the local, regional and uh, even the national levels. These, uh, th this instrument seeks to protect existing lands and to combat degradation which has already occurred. And these are very important factors in discussions taking place around sustainable development, particularly goal number 15. It's 10 times cheaper to help communities to manage their lands, which are often their only productive asset. And to help them to ensure food security than it is to assist them in times of famine. It's much cheaper then to prevent than to resolve once crises have arisen. If communities are in a situation of security and their lands are productive, migrants stand a much better chance of staying at home or being able to return home. It's not just about the public sector, rather migrants and the private sector have a role to play. We know that 400 to 500 billion dollars are sent around the world in remittances every year. And this is a massive sort of source of investment in uh, tourism, trade, accommodation and infrastructure. However, we know that uh, these remittances often go to unproductive areas and key areas are very much neglected by those remittances. So, 
We have uh, instruments which seek to protect the interests of the diaspora in the management of land. I'd like to reiterate now that land management is part of people's power of decision. There are often very difficult, even impossible choices to make, but we have to manage these pressures which are in existence. I believe that it's in all our interests to ensure that resilience, stability and security of vulnerable communities can be bolstered by managing lands in a sustainable manner. In partnership with the IOM, we'll seek the means to ensure that land resources are managed efficiently and to ensure that people have their rights over the lands in which they live as well as ensuring that migrants are offered the necessary opportunities. Degradation of lands and migration have a massive impact on vast swathes of humanity. So in our collaboration, we should ensure that the world faces up to this reality. In the post-2015 goals and the new climate agreement, Sustainable land management should allow vulnerable populations to stay on their lands if they wish to do so. We need to ensure that these precious tools are used appropriately, and that's something which the birds would even envy of us. Thank you very much. That's a very clear message about the link.